Uh, so maybe to, to jump into things, we're not going to hang around too much chatting. Um, we'll start with a little bit of an introduction to uh, myself and Guillaume, um, just so you kind of get an idea of our backgrounds and how we've kind of uh, been using computational design ourselves over the last few years. So uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar with myself, my name's Oliver Thomas. I'm a British architect. Um, I studied in the UK and became a, a qualified architect. Uh, I'm the, one of the co-founders of Architect Network, along with Guillaume and Faisal. Uh, and I'm also the current design technology manager at BIG here in London. Um, so yeah, I've, I've kind of, my background, I've been a designer, I've been a facade consultant, and I'm now a kind of specialist. And I've always been interested in technology, and I've always been kind of gravitated towards uh, computational design and grasshopper. and I, at university, I was definitely kind of really interested in computation and, and learning things like Grasshopper. But unfortunately, there wasn't really a lot of resources at uh, during my master's to, to do it and to learn it. So I was kind of having to learn a lot myself. Uh, obviously, there was YouTube at that time, but it wasn't as popular in terms of um, videos and stuff you can download and, and watch. Uh, but it was one of these things that, like, with Grasshopper, you can get stuck for ages without learning. So... Um, you know, I went to some of the courses and found these one on ones like, uh, you know, they were useful, but I found that no one really explained exactly how to do these, you know, the reasoning behind why you're doing this stuff and these components. So uh, I started to learn a lot more when I was in practice. I worked as a designer and I started to use it to like create facades and design things. I then worked at Front where I got to use computational design and Grasshopper to fabricate and build facades. Um, we work, worked on a lot of products like uh, the Zaha Morpheus Hotel and things like that. And now I'm using it a lot, uh, obviously at Big. I kind of am an in-house consultant where I'm helping teams with computational design, BIM, augmented reality, and virtual reality. So I've always been interested in the intersection of architecture and technology, hence why we started the Architect <laughs> Network. Um, that's a little bit of my background. Guillaume, do you want to uh, give the crowd a bit, a bit of a background to yourself? Yeah, yeah, I'll do a quick one. Thanks, Ali. Um, so I'm a French architect, or um, I was trained in France. I actually uh did uh, what's called a dual degree architecture engineering um in lyon and uh, i saw there is a maybe at least one french person in the audience so yeah I... <laughs> um and uh yeah so i actually started my career on the engineering side as a structural engineer and from my engineering um education i kind of knew a little bit of programming and then it became really useful once i started as an engineer um, just simply uh, visual basic programming to deal with pretty much just numbers at this point um, and trying to optimize some workflows. Um, but in the back of my head, I wanted to go back to architecture eventually, and I had the opportunity to work at BIG for about seven years total. Um, started at the bottom as a junior designer and went up to uh, being a project lead there. Uh, and through this experience, I was, I started to like, you know, I started with the scripting side, but then Grasshopper came on and it's just easier to share with people that don't know programming, obviously. Uh, and it's just more convenient for like day-to-day -day applications, uh, it just goes so much faster. Um, so it was integrated in my workflow as I was designing options, et cetera, and proposing and people starting to like peek at my screen and be interested. Um, so started to do some uh, schools internally in the office too, to kind of share that knowledge. Uh, and then when Ollie came on board, I guess we kind of took it to the next level, did an actual true, uh, what was it? Three half days kind of solid yeah. training for everyone uh, so that we can really go through the basics because you know, an hour or so here and there is not enough. So I feel like yeah. we need to dive in. And that's that's um, kind of where this grasshopper course came from. This is this is very much based on what we teach in house at at Big, and uh, we've we've obviously tweaked it a, f a bit for uh, for ATN. But um, you know, we spent some time really thinking about what are the foundations of grasshopper and how can we teach that to completely new people to the world of grasshopper. So yeah, 
my life took me now to Arizona, so I'm not that big anymore. But um, I think this thing that we started together, Oliver, and with Faisal uh, is set to last. So that's what ties us from Arizona to London to Nigeria <laughs> Yeah, uh, at this point. We do have uh, an AI Faisal in the background. So um, a few before we jump into a few like uh, housekeeping things. So like we want everyone to ask questions. Obviously, you're not on the video with us, but uh, you are welcome to ask questions. You can just simply ask questions in the YouTube chat, uh, comment in the chats, and we'll we'll at certain points we'll we'll pause and ask questions. We do also have a Discord channel, which you can see in the link below uh, in the description to this video. And Faisal is there uh, listening to your questions and he'll be uh, fielding some questions. And uh, so if you have a question a long time at any point, post it, either comment below or on our Discord. I have a, I have a rule and we've always said this whenever we teach it, there are no stupid questions. Ask any questions like this event is live. Yes, but uh, it won't be hosted on YouTube. So, uh, you know, once we take it down, it will be taken down. There are no stupid questions. If you're thinking this question, probably half the other people in the audience are also thinking that question. So don't hesitate. Um, if the, the only thing is, if you do comment in uh, uh, YouTube, we obviously can see uh, who you are. If it's in Discord, it will be a little bit more anonymous. Uh, the Discord is also uh, not just for this event. Uh, that is something that we're going to curate uh, as we move forward. So you'll be part of the Architect Network in Discord where you can you know, post a question in the community and us can answer it. Uh, and you'll see what's, uh, what kind of things are coming up in the future. So I think that's it. There's a little bit of an introduction. Uh, there's already a question that I think I might answer from, from someone in the comments. Do you have to learn code to use Grasshopper? The answer to that is no, not really traditional code. And in fact, in this presentation, we'll address just that. Um, so yeah, I think that's it. Let's, uh, without further ado, I know you guys have been waiting for this, so let's just uh, jump into it. Don't you think, Guillaume, is there anything else we need to add? Let's go for it. I'm looking for my list as, uh, as I'm taking this things off. All right, let's jump on. Uh, okay, I'm going to share my screen. Uh, Guillaume and I are going to disappear for a little bit whilst uh, whilst I go through this presentation, uh, and then we'll reappear a little bit later. <laughs> All right, guys, so uh, the first part of this course is really just going to be an introduction to computational design uh, and Grasshopper itself. OK, so uh, the th first thing we're going to talk about is what is Grasshopper? Uh, if you look up the definition or you Google it, it basically says Grasshopper is an algorithmic modeling plugin for Rhino that uses visual programming language. Uh, obviously, that makes it extremely clear what it is. Uh, not. <laughs> so we're going to try and explain that in a slightly uh, clearer way, I hope. Uh, so what is Grasshopper? What is algorithmic modeling plugin? And what is visual programming? So, you know, in a very, very basic sense, uh, Grasshopper is a plugin for Rhino that allows us to uh, get under the hood of Grasshopper, uh, sorry, Rhino's functionality uh, and create basic algorithms and uh, scripts and processes using the Grasshopper components and interface. The typical kind of workflow for Grasshopper is you are, you know, usually referencing something in the Rhino world. So you're referencing a piece of geometry, a massing or something. You bring it into the Grasshopper canvas. You execute a bunch of, uh, uh, you execute a process of these kind of step-by-step -step, uh, components and things like that. And then you output something back into your Rhino uh, workspace. Now, you know, th this is the what I would say is the basic uh, workflow for Grasshopper. But honestly, it could be anything. You could be uh, importing information from Grasshopper from an Excel file and then using that to build geometry in Rhino. You could go from Rhino to Grasshopper into Revit. Uh, so that, you know, it, it really is a, is a blank canvas in, in terms of how you use it. But this is your typical workflow. And this is what we'll, we'll be doing a fair bit today. We'll be creating things in Rhino, reference them into Grasshopper, and vice versa. Uh, the second question is, and, and one of the comments already was, do we need to know uh, uh, coding? 
And the answer is no, because you know uh, when you say coding, you think of this, right? A uh, lines and lines of code, or like in the movies, is someone in a hoodie trying to hack into uh, some kind of someone else's computer or something like that. Uh, architects do use coding, um, and you know, as, as specialists, we we do use a bit of coding and things like that. Uh, but for the most part, we use what's called uh, visual coding. So as as architects, we are very visual people. We, um, you know, we spend all our time making 3D objects in a virtual world, um, and so it kind of makes sense to, that our version of coding is uh, done visually. So instead of lines and lines of code, you have these little components that are uh, laid on what's called a canvas and joined together through uh, wires. And through this, you can create a kind of sequence of uh, of uh, components and functions that collectively uh, can make some really intricate, interesting uh, processes. So if you look at these two examples, on the left-hand side, we have a code example. And on the right-hand side, we have a visual scripting example. They both do exactly the same thing, right? So this is just using a kind of uh, a basic script to kind of move an object. And you have to insert uh, various different like uh, requirements for, to make that function work. The same thing happens in Grasshopper, right? This is the, the component and the function we're trying to use. These are the inputs you need to kind of add in order to uh, make it work. And so uh, the reason why this is kind of way more um, usable for us as architects is one, you can really kind of see and also play around with things uh, in a real-time basis. So when you're in Grasshopper, your typical Grasshopper script can look a lot like this, right? So on the, on the left-hand side, or at the beginning of your script, you have all these parameters and, and sliders that are controlling various things. Uh, in the middle, you have the functionality, the, the kind of uh, whatever it is that you're doing, or the, the sequence of uh, components and functions. And at the end, you have some kind of output that you would bake back into the Rhino space. You can kind of also read what's going on here. And you can also see in the background as you're uh, developing your script, you can also see uh, the thing that is producing, the geometry that you're actually creating. In this script, you can kind of read that it's making a grid. It's uh, obviously putting a sphere on each one of the intersections of the grid. And then there is some kind of uh, setup where there's a point somewhere in the middle here, and the closer the sphere gets to the point, the smaller the sphere is. Um, and so this is your kind of a very, very basic but typical script where on, you have your inputs, you have your process, and then some kind of output. And so typically the way that Grasshopper works, and a good place to start with Grasshopper, is to think of it as a kind of a linear process. You, you, you may know where you want to get, and we're simply using the computer to get there a bit quicker. So I, I always say with Grasshopper, a good place to start is to think about um, how you would actually ma uh, manually model this thing and try and just record that in Grasshopper. Uh, even with a linear process, scripts can get very, very complicated. Um, but it's but it's uh, it's still quite a powerful thing. But Grasshopper is uh, capable of taking that one step further, where you can actually start to have a conversation with your computer. So uh, you know you're inputting things and you're creating some kind of uh, scripts. Uh, the computer is actually spitting things back at you, so it can spit uh, you know a hundred different options of a tower massing, and then you can pick five that it then goes in and iterates again. And this is where that kind of generative process comes from. So for the most of today and, and uh, you know, from beginner to intermediate, you're, you're, you're typically working with a linear design process or a linear computational process. Another way to look at the term computational design and grasshopper is to think of our friend, uh, Mr. Dell here, who uh, many of us sit all day in front of our, our little uh, friend, whether he's called Dell or Alienware or Mr. Mac or whatever they're called. Uh, you know, we don't usually think about what our, our little colleague here is good at, right? So, hello, this is Dell, uh, and Dell's very good at these things, right? It's it's uh, he's very good at maths. He's uh, incredibly good at processing large amounts of data, communicating really quickly. He's obviously got a great memory. 
uh, if he's got enough space to fit it in. Uh, and all these kind of things that we, we know computers are really good at is otherwise known as computation, right? This is the, the kind of computational power of a computer, and these are the things that a computer is really good at. So when we talk about computational design and, and the term I'm a computational designer and things like that, it's essentially just referring to, to you uh, designing with the use of computers, which may use a mathematical approach, or you may be using it to generate geometries, objects, information, uh, and architecture itself, right? So as computational designers, you're really just utilizing the computational power of your computer to design things, right? And this is where that term, for me, computational design is the kind of umbrella term for that. And underneath it, you you will also hear in this space of parametric design, right? Uh, automation, generative design, even BIM, AI, and scripting, right? All of these kind of terms uh, are subcategories of computational design. We're utilizing the computational power of our computer to design things. But even as as uh, even within the industry, like people uh, debate whether it should be called parametric design or computational design. Uh, and honestly, it, it doesn't matter. You can call it whatever you want to call it. Uh, I think it, it, there is a kind of interesting argument that parametric design, in theory, all architecture is parametric in that you know, everything, the site itself is a parameter, uh, the brief is a parameter, um, uh, but it's kind of, you know, was was coined in the early days of Grasshopper, and it's almost become like a bit of a style, but, uh, you know, doesn't really matter. Whether you call it parametric design, computational design, I, I lean more towards the computational design uh, headline, but whatever you call it, uh, whether, you know, parametrics, computational design, scripting, uh, one thing I really, really want to get across, and one thing that's, that's as, a, as a computational designer, we're always kind of um, uh, trying to uh, change the stigma that comes with tools like Grasshopper is that, uh, you know, parametric computational design, it doesn't mean only super complex uh, expressive geometry, right? I think, um, you know, and this project here is, is not at all a, a swipe at, at Zaha. I think this is a project that I worked on uh, as a facade specialist, and I was kind of, uh, the computational design has given us the ability to create these amazing forms and these amazing shapes and designs, and also given us the ability to actually go and build them. And without these tools, buildings like this would not be possible. And uh, that's an amazing thing that, that happened within our industry. And, and over the last few years, we've been using Grasshopper and computational design um, to you know, create this amazing architecture. But really that's been uh, the tip of the iceberg, to be honest. And we've always been kind of working our way, you know, even now when you say we're gonna use Grasshopper, people think your building is, or your design is gonna turn into this, you know, super complicated expressive geometry. When we look at this other kind of, if we go to the complete other end of the spectrum, we have uh, this tower here, which is in New York. This is uh, Raphael Vinoli's uh, super tower in New York. And this is a very, very simple uh, building in terms of geometry, right? right. It's, uh, the plan is a square, the windows are square. You can see uh, it almost looks like it's the same floor to floor uh, all the way up the tower. Uh, it's not one that you would look at and think, ah, oh, they probably uh, scripted that, right? And uh, I, to be honest, I don't know if they did or they didn't use uh, any kind of computational tools in this in this project. But it is incredibly scriptable. It's incredibly logical, right? You can see uh, the the base of the building uh, is is very definable as a rectangle. You could very quickly model this and ex and test out various different sizes for those windows. Um, and even though it's an incredibly simple building, you could use a simple building from a geometry perspective, you could use computational design to iterate through this and detail it very quickly. The building on the right hand side, you, you would need grasshopper and, and computational tools to, to quickly uh, model it. But the left hand side, you could use computation to, to uh, model it to a really high degree really quickly. And then what's interesting is you could then take that script and iterate through other things. So maybe they would have had more time if they wanted to as, as the designers of this to uh, play around with different size uh, openings for the window. Maybe there's a gradient from 
large to small, maybe they can shift the floor plates. So, um, you know, whilst um, this is not like a very geometrically complex building and it doesn't, you look at it and you don't think, oh, they probably use Grasshopper to design this. This is a very scriptable building. And then, of course, as uh, Bigsters, we have to mention uh, where we kind of fit, you know, into this. And um, I think Big is a good example of, of uh, somewhere in the middle of, of uh, you know, uh, expressive yet um, kind of pure geometry. So this is our Vancouver Tower. Uh, what's interesting about this is you can clearly see we're kind of utilizing computation on on two parts. One, to create interesting interesting uh function driven form so in this case if you were to think about the surface that is actually creating the vancouver tower that that is a, a quite a complex double curved surface right but then the question is how do you actually uh turn that surface and build it using conventional uh uh building methodologies um and you get this kind of uh interesting pixelated effect where each kind of unit is uh you know, protruding from the original surface. So it's something that is very much ingrained in our design process and in many design processes around the world. So here you can see, again, our towers. This is a Vancouver Tower in uh, Vancouver, Canada, and also the TELUS Sky, Sky Tower that's also in Canada. We're clearly using computation as part of the design process at BIG. The Serpentine Pavilion is also a great example of how do you build quite a complex shape out of this simple uh, um, extruded boxes. Uh, the Coco Towers, how can you add a simple twist into your building to maximize uh, views as you go up the building? But it's not just about design. Like I said, like you can use computation to also uh, you know, turn these ideas into built form. Like what if the contractor needs that each one of these balconies actually extends in increments of 200 millimeters or 300 or whatever that numbers are. We can use computation uh, to rationalize and optimize our design. Again, the serpentine, I think, is a great example. Like, how do you make this really interesting? Uh, if you think about the underlying surface of this, it's, a, it's again, it's a complex double curved surface. But how do we build it out of sheet planar materials um, and construct it in a way that's that's uh, simple and achievable based on the budget and timeline that we have. Also, how can you make sure that each box overlaps uh, with including tolerances and things like that, uh, so that when it does rain, because this was based in London, uh, it's not you know a completely porous structure, right? There's a, also a little bit of uh, shame. The 103 course, I will add, will cover uh, the actual uh, scripting of the subtype pavilion. And then, for example, the, the uh, Miami Towers, how do you add a twist, but at the same time, make sure the structure doesn't kind of uh, go over certain parameters? How do you make sure you maximize those views uh, without the structure protruding through the facade or, uh, you know, cantilevering or something like that based on the structural engineer's uh, parameters, for example? So, you know, it's something that's, that uh, I have and we've been using in the office as part of our design process. It's a design tool, right? We use Grasshopper as a way to uh, iterate through different designs, explore different designs. Uh, so it's very much ingrained in our design. We can use it also to analyze our designs as we're designing them. So, you know, we could, we could take a massing. This is a very quick, uh, fun snapshot of like, uh, a quick uh, daylight analysis of uh, the serpentine so that maybe we could uh, work out uh, where we could put solar panels if, if we were going to put solar panels on or something like that. So we can use computation to analyze our designs as we design them. We can also use it for optimization. Like what if we tried to optimize the, the pavilion so that uh, this diagram here kind of highlights which boxes are of similar length. So then we can kind of look at this and think, is there a way we can optimize this so it's a little more efficient to fabricate them without losing uh, the intended form? And finally, we can take this all the way through to actual fabrication. Like if we've been using grasshopper and computation to actually uh, create uh, all these objects, how can we use that to continue that process into the actual act of fabrication? Um, I think one of the main things and one, one of the reasons that we want to host this and we've been hosting it uh, for free live here on, on YouTube is we want to avoid people doing 
what's called manumetrics. So this is something we've nicknamed manumetrics. And as you can see from the icon of someone kind of exhausted at their desk, this is when people try to create uh, <laughs> computationally looking designs uh, without using computation. And for example, this brick wall, someone is rotating each block individually a thousand times, right? Whenever we see people doing this or, or if you're doing this, uh, come join the Discord and ask us uh, some clues on how you could do it or, uh, you know, go onto our YouTube and look up videos. Because, you know, I think um, throughout my throughout my career from university all the way into practice, like you, I have come across this and I've always go to people just stop let's have a look at this and let's take take a little script for it so at all costs we want to avoid manumetrics in the industry uh hence why we we wanted to create this course and at least attempt to give you guys a basics of uh of grasshopper so the other thing is that you know uh, when we talk about computation, what computational tools are we actually using uh if those of you who um who are new to Architect Network, you can follow us on Instagram where we post, we've been asking various established and emerging firms about the tools and technologies they actually use on projects. And what's interesting is even though we're, seven, we're only 17 projects in, you can see computation is one of the most used categories that we have. So I think the number is at 94%, which is, means there's only maybe one or two, I think, of people that are not haven't used computational tools on uh, the, the project that they submitted. And out of those uh, computational tools, Grasshopper has been by far the most common uh, computational tool we have. It also is worth noting that Rhino is uh, consistently the most used modeling platform so far that uh, in, in our questions. And so most firms, uh, you know, these I would say are a typical array of computational tools that that people use. So we have uh, Grasshopper, which obviously uh, I've given a bit of introduction. Rhino Inside, which is a little bit of a cheat because uh, Rhino Inside is just Grasshopper inside of other programs. And it's most commonly used inside of Revit. So now you can use Rhino and Grasshopper to reference and create real Revit geometry. Uh, Dynamo is, of course, uh, Revit's own version. It's their own Grasshopper. Uh, which is specifically for Revit. And of course, uh, there are various different programming languages that's used in the AEC industry. Uh, but by far, I would say Python is probably the most uh, useful uh, to use. But of course, today we're only interested in Grasshopper uh, because I think that is the one that I recommend for people to learn and to enter the world of, of computational design. And whenever you're learning Grasshopper, people always ask me, like, what's the best way to learn Grasshopper? How do I learn Grasshopper? I think I've distilled it into these four elements, uh, which the aim of this course is to address uh, most of these areas uh, as we go along. So the first thing is actually one that people don't necessarily think of straight away, and that is thinking computationally or computational thinking. So... You know, whenever if if Guillaume and I were going to create a script for uh, for someone, or or we were just you know talking between us, we would kind of usually start with a piece of paper and sketch out the idea that we're trying to create or the problem we're trying to solve, and trying to think a little bit about the steps that we need to go through in order to create that thing uh, or that process. And there are lots of books on you know, thinking computationally that come from, you know, more traditional coding backgrounds like, you know, Silicon Valley and, uh, you know, development coding. Uh, it's one thing I really recommend to spend some time looking into because I think uh, it is a slightly different way of thinking than you do as a, you know, traditional architect or designer. And I really think it complements a lot of what you need as an architect. Uh, so the first thing is just starting to think computationally. How do you break down this problem into a step-by-step -step, uh, phases or step-by-step -step problems? The second one is components, right? Uh, there is a big part of just learning what components Grasshopper is. And this is one where um, it's, you know, 
I could sit if I was to sit here and talk to you through all the components, you'd be here. We'd be here for maybe a day and a half, and you guys would probably be extremely bored at that point. <laughs> so, a big part of components is just over experience. Uh, we'll obviously be covering a lot, a lot of new ones today. Uh, but a good place to start is if you're already familiar with Rhino, uh, just think of the commands that you that you use. Um, so then, you know, you'll be able to, um, you know, rethink and step through that process of how you actually m model it manually. I'm always learning new components myself. It was only like last week I was helping out uh, an intern and they were using a component that I'd totally forgotten about, or there was another one which I'd, I'd actually never used. And so you're always learning about new components and things like that. The other two elements, which are really what we'll cover in these two days is lists, which is kind of the way data is, uh, is structured behind the scenes in, in the form of lists and data trees. And I always say to someone, when once you've understood and mastered lists and data trees, that is when you become a grasshopper zen, a grasshopper uh, wizard, so to speak. Uh, so that is some of the things that we will be uh, going through today and tomorrow. Today we'll be learning about more lists. Tomorrow will be data trees. Uh, so that's a little introduction of uh, computational design. Now, uh, I don't know if there's any uh, questions. I'll stop here if there's any questions about computational design. Um, and we'll just be, let me just have a look through the comments as we go along. Um, I think there was a question about how much of a rhino do you need to know? I mean, I guess you kind of answered it yeah. already a little bit, but maybe you can elaborate on that. Yeah, um, I think you know we are assuming there's a little bit of uh, of of uh, knowledge around. Maybe I'll Guillaume, I'll bring us on so we're we're not just talking to a screen. So I think there is a little bit of um, knowledge of Rhino. Uh, it, during this course, it's going to be fairly basic, so you should be able to follow along pretty easily. Uh, but of course, Grasshopper is a plugin to um, into um, Rhino. So you know, it's where we spend as, as designers most of our time. Um, so yeah, I think as your Grasshopper knowledge uh, continues, your your Rhino knowledge will also continue, uh, which as it, as you can see in our project programs feature, it's one of the number one used modeling tools uh, out there. So yeah. Um, and to add to that, like to me, actually, I didn't know so much Rhino when I started scripting it, I kind of learned it together. And I felt like you actually get to understand better Rhino in some ways when you yeah. start scripting because you have to be very explicit about all the commands whereas in rhino you kind of click around and things happen but it helps you kind of understand what's in the background a little bit more so it definitely helped me the other way as well yeah i see there's a lot of people um any books i can recommend on computational design um yeah i think there is uh um, a few books I'll think of. I'm trying to remember the name. I'm going to look it up as I um, as I'm talking to you guys because I can't remember what it was called. You know the book I'm thinking of. Uh, let me see if I can quickly find it. Uh, no. Yeah, there I'll post up a few books. What was it Paramount? Uh, <laughs> it sounds uh, silly, but that's a good one. Um, there are some books on thinking computationally, but honestly, I don't, there's not that many books I've started, I've used for learning computational design. Uh, it's mainly been YouTube videos, online courses and things like this, right? Where you can actually interact a little bit more. There is a book I love. It's not, uh, specifically about scripting, but it's about geometry and it actually teaches you geometry, um, in a way that's kind of scriptable. And I think there are a few examples of scripts in there too. It's called Architectural Geometry by Helmut Potman. Um, it's a Bible of like anything you need to know. So again, as like the first step of scripting is kind of also understanding geometry in general. And then once you understand that, then things will come naturally in a way. So yeah. I would start there. The other book I was trying to think is uh, AAD Algorithms Algorithmic Aided Design by Arturo Tedeschi. Tedeschi? 
Um, that was the one book I did buy, and hopefully we will get him on the podcast at some point, but we've been trying to track him down. Um, yeah, I, there was also some people that asked about the PDF. Um, yeah, we will make the PDF accessible uh, after the course. There is a Google Drive uh, below uh, in the comments, so you can also access some of the scripts that we'll be doing, and we'll post a few afterwards. Is this video going to be available after the live session? Yes, it is. We we I hope we're recording this, but we should be recording this, uh, and it's going to be put on our website afterwards. Um, depending on how the turnout has been, we will you know maybe host it for free for a few uh, for a few weeks after this event. Uh, but there is also a uh, 103 bonus class that will be available through a small payment uh, in order for us to help support the ATN network and continue to bring some more courses in the future. This is our first course, and hopefully it's going to be a uh, first course of many. Another question, why would you use Grasshopper rather than a Dynamo in Revit? Yeah, so I mean, Dynamo has been, been great over the years. Um, but it's it's definitely a little clunky to use. And you know, now that we have Rhino inside, we design in Rhino and we document in Revit. So um, having that bridge between the two, like many firms, we go back and forth. Um, it's just very, very uh, e it's much easier to kind of um, bounce between our two platforms using Rhino inside instead of going through, uh, Dynamo, and then converting it into something else, Grasshopper and Revit. So before our workflow may have been Rhino, Grasshopper, you know, Excel, Dynamo, Revit in a very basic form. Now it's Rhino, Grasshopper, Revit. So it, it's just simplified a lot of our um, a lot of our workflow. Top ten most used components, uh, <laughs> probably Move. Uh, the, the top 10 most used components are probably the most boring ones. They're like the vectors. Uh, list item. List item, move, <laughs> slider. <laughs> uh, the uh, parameter the viewer and a panel. Yeah. <laughs> top yeah, maybe we'll make a post of that. The top 10 most used components. It probably won't be very exciting, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> but that's a, funny, that's a fun question. Uh, Oh, here we go. Thank you. Computer design hasn't been simply explained more than what Ollie just gave now. So thank you. Thank you for the compliment. Yeah, I mean, honestly, our big goal uh, is to try and explain these things clearly. We'll do a few more questions. Otherwise, we'll we'll jump into it. But how is Grasshopper different from Maya? That's a that's an interesting question. So Maya is a is a modeling platform, right? So Maya is more similar to Rhino, right? It's a it's a modeling platform. Maya also has its own uh computational um plugin i forget what it's called um but you know uh it has its own computational view it is a good question because i think a lot of people using you know the zaha building as an example they actually probably mo modeled the massing in maya and then created the exoskeleton in grasshopper um why well, I, I i i pretty much know that they use that for workflow. So Maya is is really its own thing. It's a it's a great freeform modeling tool, uh, but it's not a very powerful computational tool. Um, Grasshopper is is purely computational. Maya would be put under the category of of modeling, not computation. Uh, if I was to kind of put it in there, are we going to cover Rhino inside Revit? Revit? Yes, we will. Not today, but we will in the future. And to give you guys a little bit of a uh, a preview, we're probably going to follow this course up with a Revit masterclass, and then after that, a Rhino inside Revit masterclass. What is the book name? Uh, I posted but, yeah. it in the in the chat. Architectural okay. geometry. Okay, I think we'll uh, we'll pause for the questions here. Uh, man, there's a lot of there's a lot of questions here. Wow. Um, so yeah. Uh, someone said, can you make something in Grasshopper and render in 3ds Max? Uh, yes, you can do that. Uh, it's it's really, think of, of Grasshopper as just Rhino, right? We're just making things in Rhino using Grasshopper, but we'll bake it into Rhino and then you can bring it into uh, things like that. 
uh, 3ds yeah. max you can bring grasshopper is a little hand that helps you model in rhino basically yeah yeah um but these are great thank you for all these questions um here I'll, uh there's one other question to answer equivalent to rhino inside for archicad What's up? If that's Georgie, the Creative Insider, make sure to check out the Creative Insider podcast. Really great podcast with some really great people in. Uh, I actually think Archicad was one of the earliest BIM platforms to have. I, I thought Archicad had an, an interface with Grasshopper, I'm pretty sure. Uh, so I think Archicad actually has a good connection with Grasshopper. Otherwise, I don't think there is like a Rhino inside for Archicad yet, but maybe in the future um all right let's let's move on because i don't want to we will stop for questions along the way and there will be a qa we will do a break in the middle of this um probably in an hour or so once we uh finish off explaining what lists are for five for 10 minutes where you can just grab a cup of tea and uh or a coffee depending on where you are um so next up, we're just going to jump into the course. The final thing I will say is, uh, obviously, we're hosting this co course completely free live on YouTube. Uh, as we, as many of you know, we are just starting out our YouTube channel the last few months ago. So uh, by simply, you can help us out by simply hitting that silly little subscribe button below. Hit the little button, and you'd really help us out uh, by just liking and subscribing this video. So uh, without any further ado, let's go ahead and let's jump into actually learning some grasshoppers. So I'm going to remove Guillaume and myself from the screen because you're probably bored of seeing us. Uh, and let's get back into it.